Hello, and greetings, lovely person, from RPG Mods Fan. This video is part one of my walkthrough and review of the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventure, Waterdeep, Dragon Heist, which was published by Wizards of the Coast in September of 2018. Chris Perkins was the lead designer, but there were many contributors, including Matthew Mercer of Critical Role fame. Reviewing and discussing the Waterdeep Dragon Heist will probably be my biggest and most ambitious project to date on my YouTube channel. Several videos will be needed to walk through the whole adventure. In this video, I will be going over the adventure's setup and initial quest. I will not go in depth into the background which I will save for my next video. Unlike other D&D adventures, Waterdeep Dragon Heist does a good job of giving the players its background information more organically, instead of through exposition dumps. In this adventure, player characters start at level 1. By the end of the adventure, they should reach at least 5th level. Waterdeep Dragon Heist is a treasure hunt with an urban backdrop. Waterdeep is a city in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting and where the adventure takes place in. It is a very large metropolis on the northern part of the Sword Coast. It is known as the City of Splendors and is home to some of the most powerful figures in the Forgotten Realms. The displayed map depicts the boundaries of the eight districts of Waterdeep. They are the Sea, Field, North, Castle, City of the Dead, Trades, Dock, and Southern Wards. Oh, and by the way, the City of the Dead is Waterdeep's public cemetery. During the course of the adventure, the player characters will probably visit all the city's wards. Displayed is the player's map of Waterdeep. It is huge! On the other side is the Dungeon Master's map of the city. These huge maps probably are the only things that will make this adventure unwieldy. The seat of Waterdeep's government is in the Castle Ward. The city is ruled by the Masked Lords and the Open Lord. Only the Open Lord's identity is known by its populace. Laurel Silverhand is now the Open Lord of Waterdeep. Why does Ed Greenwood have so many concealed rulers throughout his Forgotten Realms setting? Is he a secret society sycophant? What the sh**? Even John F. Kennedy, who I greatly admire, gave a speech against those who secretly pull the strings of government and operate from the shadows. Okay, rant over. The High Wizard of Waterdeep is known as the Black Staff. The current Black Staff of Waterdeep is Vajra Safar. Displayed is Waterdeep's legal code. The Dungeon Master should hand this handout to their players. Basically, the rulers of Waterdeep do not want or tolerate lawlessness. The Adventure Book's introduction chapter has helpful suggestions on character creation so that the player characters better fit the background of the adventure. Because Waterdeep is a big cosmopolitan city, there are hardly any restrictions on character creation. The city has many guilds, noble families, and factions. As a background, a player character may already be part of a faction. If not, then sometime after the initial quest, they will have the opportunity to join a faction which the adventure book highly recommends. 
mainly because the book contains side quests that are faction related. Mainly through these side quests, the player character or characters will gain renown within their faction. In addition to the five typical factions, there are an additional three factions the player characters can join. Harpers are altruists who work behind the scenes to keep power out of the hands of evil tyrants. This would, of course, put them at odds with the Centaurum and Xanathar gangs. Any smart, non-evil character can join the Harpers. Bards and wizards are especially welcome. The Lord's Alliance is a confederation of cities and towns up and down the Sword Coast, including, among others, Waterdeep, Baldur's Gate, Mirabar, Mithril Hall, Neverwinter, and Silvery Moon. Members of the Alliance must come to one another's aid in times of need, and the organization uses field operatives such as diplomats, spies, and assassins to safeguard its interests. Waterdeep is one of the most influential and invested members of the Lord's Alliance. The Order of the Gauntlet's mission is to seek out and destroy evil before it gains a foothold. Any non-evil character can join the Order. Clerics, monks, and paladins are especially welcome, particularly if they worship Helm, Torm, or Tyre. The Emerald Enclave's goal is to seek harmony between nature and civilization. However, they are more nature lovers. Druids and rangers are especially welcome to join them. Waterdeep harbors a few members of the faction. These members help guard the city against unnatural threats, including aberrations and undead. They also watch over the City of the Dead and the city's parks. The Centaurum, also known as the Black Network, has an open recruitment policy. Anyone can join. It is a shadow organization that trades and traffics anything for a profit, including mercenaries, weapons, slaves, illicit substances, and even normal goods. Again, anything for a profit. A character must be a drow, preferably a male, to join the Bregan Derth faction. The Bregan Derth was originally made up of outcasts of destroyed drow houses. The group's leader is Charlaxel Bainray. He is always looking for new members to fill the ranks. His company takes more espionage-like missions over mercenary ones. Force Grey is an elite group only answerable to both the Blackstaff and the Open Lord of Waterdeep. However, currently Veshra Safar, the Blackstaff, is more involved with managing and operating Force Grey than is the Open Lord of Waterdeep. An individual who is serving or has served in the City Watch or the City Guard is an eligible member of the Grey Hands. Characters who swear an oath to defend Waterdeep, its citizens, and its laws with their lives are also eligible to join the Grey Hands. Members of Force Grey are picked from members of the Grey Hands. In other words, becoming a member of Force Grey is by invitation only. Waterdeep has outright outlawed a thieves' guild to exist in it. However, the Xanathar Guild serves as Waterdeep's unofficial thieves' guild. Anyone can join the Xanathar Guild. But before membership is granted, an applicant must pass a test that always involves a serious crime being committed. 
Also, the adventure book does not give any side quests for those who become members of the Xanathar Guild, probably because those side quests would be heinous crimes and the authors did not want to go that dark or vile. As a side note, Xanathar's true nature is supposed to be a secret that hardly anyone in Waterdeep knows. In order to make life easier, the Dungeon Master may be tempted to limit the number of factions that player characters can join. Other than making the Xanathar Guild a non-joinable faction, I would strongly suggest against that. Waterdeep will seem more real and alive if all these factions are operating at the same time. Likewise, for the Dungeon Master, things will be a lot easier if all the player characters decide to join the same faction. However, the game will definitely have more drama if the characters join different factions. Despite its name, Dragon Heist is not a true heist. Instead, the plot hook is for the player characters to recover Waterdeep's gold that was stolen from its treasury some time ago. In other words, someone else did the heist. Hence, Waterdeep Dragon Heist is more of an adventure of investigation. By the way, a gold piece in Waterdeep is called a dragon. I will call it a gold piece from now on for simplicity's sake. Of course, there are others after the treasure who the player characters will have to contend with. Although there are combat encounters, combat is definitely not the focus on this adventure. In other words, this is more of a role-playing adventure. Thus, experience points and levels gained is based on meeting milestones instead of through combat. <laughs> like so many other D&D adventures, this adventure starts in a tavern. But not in just any ordinary tavern. This one starts in the famous Yawning Portal Tavern and Inn, a popular adventurer's hangout. The Yawning Portal is located near the intersections of Waterdeep's Castle Ward, Dock Ward, and Trades Ward. There are seven NPCs that are found or often frequent the tavern. Each player is supposed to select one NPC as a friendly acquaintance. This NPC will be someone the player character knows and trusts. This serves as further background for both the player character and the adventure. Dernan is a retired adventurer and is the tavern's proprietor and innkeeper. Bonnie is one of the barmaids of the tavern. Matsrim Three Strings Mereg is a bard and often performs at the tavern. He tends to be socially awkward. Charlester Silvermane is a frequent patron of the tavern. His physical features betray that he is a fighter of some sort. Maelun Ward Dragon is a cheery, optimistic, warm-hearted man and a skilled fighter. Obaya Yude is a priestess of Waikin and is from Chult. Yagra Stonefist is a half-orc thug. She likes to arm wrestle. The adventure has an exciting start to it. I will not spoil what it is. But let us just say that famed explorer and author Volothomp Gedram, more commonly known as Volo, will be impressed by the player characters. They are offered a quest by Volo and says he will award each player character 100 gold pieces upon completion of the quest. Thus, 
begins a mad romp through the wards of Waterdeep as you uncover a villainous plot involving some of the city's most influential figures. It is me, Volo Thampgedron. You can call me Volo. Nice to meet you. My friend, RPG Mods fan, will now be discussing the adventure itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Take it away, RPG Mods fan! Displayed is the Dungeon Master's map of Waterdeep. It is huge, which makes it unwieldy. As a DM, I would concentrate on where everything is by ward instead. Also, not all adventure locations are marked on this map, which makes it very frustrating for the DM to use. Again, it is me, Volo Thump Gedron. You can call me Volo. Volo's quest for the player characters entangles them in a bitter conflict between two nefarious organizations, the Xantarum and Xanathar's Guild. For completing his quest, the adventurer's background information is not too important and does not come into play just yet. So, as to not make this video too long, I will discuss the details of the adventurer's background in my next video. For now, I will just discuss the background in the most condensed format. Displayed is the adventure's storyline and background condensed into flowcharts. The adventure's plot can be summarized as follows. The ousted and former open lord of Waterdeep, Lord Dagolt Neverember, embezzles a half a million gold pieces and hides it somewhere in Waterdeep. Dagolt now lives in exile in Neverwinter, a city north of Waterdeep. Many individuals know about the cache of gold and are looking for it. The adventurers can join in on the treasure hunt and prevent the cache of gold from falling into the villain's hands of the adventure. In order to find the treasure, the Stone of Galore is needed. Basically, the Stone of Galore serves as a MacGuffin plot device for the adventure's story. The city is threatened by escalating tensions and violence between two power groups, the Xantarm and Xanathar's Guild. When they clash, the player characters are pulled into the conflict. When preparing this adventure, the next thing the Dungeon Master needs to do is pick a villain for it. Picking the villain at the same time determines the season in which this adventure occurs in. However, the adventure book does state that the DM can switch to a new villain midway through the adventure without having to change the season. If the Dungeon Master chooses Spring, then the paranoid, megalomaniacal beholder crime lord Xanathar will be the villain of the adventure. If the DM chooses Summer, then the Castle Lanterns, who are nobles and are secretly devil worshippers, will be the villains of the adventure. If the DM chooses Autumn, then the cunning, swashbuckling Drow, Charlaxel Bainray, will be the villain of the adventure. If the DM chooses Winter, then Manchun will be the villain of the adventure. Actually, this Manchun is a clone copy of the original. The original wizard Manchun 
was one of the founders of the Zentarum. This adventure book says that the Dungeon Masters can award experience points as they see fit or use milestones. To me, using milestones for awarding experience points and leveling up characters seems more fit for this adventure. As stated before, the player characters start at the Yawning Portal Tavern. They can be initially conversing with their acquaintances in the tavern, knocking back a pint of Shadowdale Ale and or chowing down on Knuckleback Trout. Then, a tavern brawl breaks out when five Xanathar thugs attack Yagra's Strongfist, who is a Xantarm thug for hire. Leading the Xanathar thugs is a male human bandit named Prince. The player characters can either get involved or hang back. Within the third round of combat, trouble arises from out of the gaping hole that is in the middle of the taproom where the yawning portal gets its namesake. A troll and nine Sturges emerge out of the hole. The Sturges have been trying to suck the troll's blood, and the troll fled up the portal trying to escape them. Dornan, the innkeeper, will draw his greatsword and battle with the troll, shouting, I could use a little help here. Within the next round, six of the nine Sturges are supposed to fly back down the yawning portal hole. If the player characters are engaged in this combat and there are other patrons involved, the Dungeon Master may wish to keep all Sturges in the fight. As a Dungeon Master, I have my players create backup characters along with their main characters. When the Waterdeep Dragon Heist adventure starts in the Yawning Portal, I would also have the backup characters present there and give a chance for the players to play them as well as their main ones during the Tavern Brawl and the Troll Fight. In the aftermath of the battle, via acquaintances or mumblings from the Tavern patrons, the player characters should be able to learn that the Zentarum and Xanathar Guild are engaged in open hostilities and are threatening the peace of the city. If one or more player characters are acquainted with Yagra, they can further learn that not even a few months ago, the Zentarum and Xanathar Guild were in negotiations to become allies. However, for some reason, the negotiations broke down and the two factions have become enemies. After the brawl, as a dungeon master, I personally would level up the player characters to level 2. Even if they took no action, I would say they gained invaluable experience just by watching veteran adventurers in combat. Volothump Gadram will be impressed by the player character's actions in the brawl. If the player characters took no action, then in this case he is intoxicated and wrongly thinks they took action in the brawl. Volo has a quest. He will order drinks for the player characters and ask them to sit with him at a quiet table. One of Volo's friends, named Floon Blagmar, has disappeared, seemingly kidnapped. He wants the player characters to find and rescue Floon. Volo describes Floon as having more beauty than brains. For accepting the quest, he pays 10 gold pieces to each character now and promises to pay 100 gold pieces upon the completion of the quest. Volo says that he last saw Floon two nights ago. 
He and Floon were drinking at the Skewered Dragon, which is a dark, bowdy tavern in the Dark Ward. Volo recommends that the player characters start their search there. So, what happened two nights ago? Unbeknownst to Volo, not long after he departed, Floon met another acquaintance named Lord Rainier Neverember at the tavern. Lord Rainier Neverember is the son of the ousted open lord Dagolt Neverember. After some more drinking, Floon and Rainier left together. Outside, five Zentarm thugs working for Erstol Fluxen jumped both of them. They took them to a warehouse in the dock ward so they could question Rainier about the whereabouts of the Stone of Galore and his father's hidden cache of gold. However, before the interrogation could begin, members of the Xenathar Guild ambushed and killed the Zent guards in the warehouse. These new arrivals mistook Floon for Rainier and dragged him away. Rainier managed to hide and escaped their notice. Floon was taken to a Xanathar Guild hideout in the sewers. A small gang of Kanku was left behind at the Zentarum warehouse to kill any other Zents who might show up at the warehouse. The presence of the Kanku has prevented Rainier from trying to leave the warehouse. The blood in the streets encounter occurs when the player characters are in the dock ward and en route to the Skewered Dragon Tavern. This encounter is the aftermath of a bloody clash between the Xanathar Guild and the Zentarum. The street has been cordoned off by the City Watch. Lying on the cobblestones are a half dozen corpses. The City Watch officers have disarmed and arrested three blood-drenched humans and are in the midst of questioning witnesses. This encounter was meant to show the City Watch in action and the escalation of the conflict between the Centaurum and the Xenathar Guild. The player characters will probably take the most direct route to the Skewered Dragon Tavern. In this case, they are likely to find the old Zoblob Shop, which has a deep purple facade and in its window hangs a stuffed beholder. The shopkeeper is a wizened old deep gnome who spies for the Xenathar Guild. The shop sells an assortment of trinkets. The gnome does not know Floon by name, but he recognizes his description. He is reluctant to share information unless persuaded, such as buying a lot of his trinkets, offering him a new purple trinket, etc. He says that Floon and a well-dressed fellow of similar appearance, who is Rainier, were jumped outside of the shop by five thugs in black leather armor. He adds that one of them had a black tattoo of a winged snake on his neck. As a rant, what I find frustrating is that the Dungeon Master's map does not mark off where the skewered dragon or the old Zblob shop are. Likewise, it does not do so for other locations described in the adventure. I really do love this adventure, but oversights like these are really frustrating, and Wizards of the Coast should have known better. The Skewered Dragon Tavern is what people would call a dive bar. It is frequented by dock workers. To get anyone to talk takes a bride or successful DC-13 charisma check. The bar's regulars remember seeing Volo and Floon drinking together a couple of nights ago. Shortly after Volo left, Rainier Neverember arrived and 
Flume continued drinking with Rainier. Both of them left around midnight. Five men followed them out, and no one in the tavern knows what happened after that. The men are known to frequent a warehouse on Candle Lane. Look for the snake symbol on the door, says one of the tavern regulars. The warehouse has a black winged snake, which is the symbol of the Santarum, painted above the door's handle. The Santarum hideout on Candle Lane is a ramshackle two story warehouse. In room number Z1 are four Cancun who are lazily looting and searching the place. However, they are alert. These Kanku are all that remain of the Xenathar Guild force that murdered almost everyone in the warehouse, except for Floon and Rainier. Rainier managed to hide, but Floon was captured and taken to a Xenathar Guild hideout. The corpses of the thugs who kidnapped Floon and Rainier are also in this room. If captured, the most important information the Kanku know is that Floon, who they mistook for Rainier, was taken to a Xanathar Guild hideout. To find it, they will say, follow the yellow signs in the sewers. Just keep in mind that the Kanku speak via mimicry like a parrot. Room number Z2 is a storage closet. Here, Rainier is hiding from the Kanku. Rainier feels guilty that Floon was taken, since he believes that the thugs mistook Floon for him. If the characters ask Rainier to join their search for Floon, he agrees to do so, arming himself with a dagger and a rapier scavenged from the dead Zents in the warehouse. If a character asks Rainier why the Zents kidnapped him, he truthfully says that the Centaurum thinks his father embezzled a large amount of gold when he was the open lord. They think that they can find the gold by using an artifact called the Stone of Galore, which was in the possession of the Xenathar Guild before it was stolen. Room number Z3 is a hidden treasure room, and within crates has four large paintings, each worth 75 gold pieces, and 15 silver bars, each worth 50 gold pieces. Shortly after the player characters find Rainier, the City Watch arrives. Heading this contingent is a captain named Hustus Staggett. He is just one of many captains of the City Watch. They will prevent anyone from leaving. Any alive Kanku are taken into custody. Captain Staggett will question the player characters. The captain and Rainier recognize each other. Due to Rainier's presence, the captain will overlook any crimes committed by the player characters but will hand them a copy of Waterdeep's Cold Legal. If the player characters ask for the Watch's help in locating Floon, Captain Staggett says he will not send a force into the sewers in search of someone who might well be a Zent or Xanathar Guild spy. Assuming the characters do not do anything stupid, such as attacking the City Watch, the captain will let them go. If the player characters do not learn of Floon's plight from the Kanku, then they can learn by bribing a local witness that Floon was seen being dragged off through the back alleyways to a circular metal cover which then leads down into the sewers. Drawn in yellow chalk on the walls of the sewers, are palm-sized circle with ten spokes radiating out of it. Following these yellow symbols will lead the player characters to the Xenathar Guild hideout where Floon 
is being held. Guarding the way into the hideout is a gazer. A gazer is a scaled down version of a beholder. The boss of this Xenathar Guild hideout is a half orc mage named Grumshar. When the player characters arrive, Grumshar is interrogating Floon Blagmar in Area Q7. Visiting the hideout is a mind flayer named Nahil Lore. Areas Q2A and B are watch posts. Dosing off in each is a goblin bowman. In room Q5 is a Durgar named Zmenk. If Krantz survive the brawl at the yawning portal, then he will also be found here. Both are preoccupied with barricading the door to room Q6. Room Q6 served as a lavatory for the hideout, but now is being overrun by a gray ooze. In room Q7, Grumshar has his foot on Floon's chest. Seated on a raised platform to the south is Nahil Lore, and he is caressing an intellect devourer. Upon seeing the adventurers, Nahil Lore rises from the stone chair, sets its pet down, and glides across the room, intending to leave through the double doors on the west wall. Given how low level the player characters are, the wise course of action is to allow the Mind Flayer to escape. After defeating Grumshar and the Intellect Devourer, the player characters can then attend to Floon Blagmar, who is in a bloodied and very weak condition. In room Q11 is a portal to Xanathar's lair. However, in order to activate it, one needs a stone eye. The only one who had the stone eye was the Mind Flayer, who is now long gone. Area Q12 is the cellar of a halfling-owned hostel on Spices Street in the Dock Ward. The hostel is used as a base of operations by the Shard Shunners a gang of halfling were-rats. They are aware of the Xanathar Guild hideout. Returning to the yawning portal with Floon Blagmar marks the end of the adventurer's introductory quest. Volo is drinking alone and anxiously awaiting news of Floon's fate. He will be very happy as soon as he sees the characters and Floon. Volo does not have enough gold to pay the reward he offered to the characters. Instead, he offers the deed to Trollskull Manor, a dilapidated manor in the North Ward. Volo recently bought the property because it is rumored to be haunted. He was planning on investigating it for his next book, Volo's Guide to Spirits and Specters. The manor is meant to be used as a base of operations for the player characters. If they accept their reward, Volo sets up a meeting with a thiefling magistrate named Kyleen Silmerhelv. The brief session takes place at a courthouse in the castle ward at noon. Magistrate Silmerhelv witnesses the transfer of the deed, rendering the new ownership official. Volo, Floon, and Rainier all express their gratitudes. If the characters need to call upon their new friends for an occasional favor, any of them are happy to oblige. Floon has little to offer the characters, but friendship with Volo and Rainier has its perks. Volo can give the party a tour of Waterdeep. If the characters accept his offer, as a dungeon master, I would give them all of Chapter 9 entitled Volo's Waterdeep and Chiridian.
as a handout. Although Rainier is estranged from his rich and powerful father, he still has friends in high places, including the Harper's faction, who can come to the character's rescue if need be. Thus ends Chapter 1 of The Adventure. If you are using Milestone Level Achievement, the adventure states to level up the characters to second level. As a DM, I would level them up to level 3. If you think this would be too soon, then throw in an extra encounter or two, such as an extra encounter in the sewers. Roll Credits Displayed are the credits found within the adventure itself. It seems I only scratched the surface when doing a walkthrough and review of the Waterdeep Dragon Heist adventure. In order not to make this video too long, I avoided discussing much of the background of the adventure, such as detailed discussion on the villains and the factions. In my next video on this adventure, I plan to fill that gap and discuss the background. Afterwards, I plan on doing videos for the rest of the adventure. I think this adventure is awesome. However, the Dungeon Master's map of Waterdeep could have been better. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye.
Hello, and greetings, lovely person from RPG Mods Fan. This video is part two of my walkthrough and review of the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventure Waterdeep Dragon Heist, which was published by Wizards of the Coast in September of 2018. In order not to repeat myself too much, I would highly recommend watching my part one video which covers the adventure's setup and initial quest before watching this video. In this video, I will be going over the adventure's background, which, of course, will be full of spoilers. I will not go in depth into the city of Waterdeep itself. I may do such a video sometime in the future after covering most everything else in the Waterdeep Dragon Heist adventure. Because this video will be discussing the adventure's background, I will try my best not to make this video an exposition dump, and I will try to be entertaining as possible. Chris Perkins mentioned that the adventure takes place in 1492DR, the year of three ships sailing. However, Dungeon Masters can adjust the year to fit with other adventures. Using the Tomb of Annihilation as an example, you can have the Death Curse start to occur after the events of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Because the player characters have proven themselves as capable adventurers, the retired adventurer and merchant Syndra Sylvain request a meeting with them at her place, and tasks them to end the curse. Originally, she is supposed to be located in Baldur's Gate, but the DM can move her to Waterdeep or send an invitation to the characters asking them to journey to Baldur's Gate. However, canonically, Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage is supposed to be run after the completion of the Waterdeep Dragon Heist adventure. I will now be discussing the adventure itself, and as I stated before, this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Displayed is the structure of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. The left flowchart summarizes its background. The upper right flowchart summarizes its sequence of important events. The lower right boxes summarizes what the adventurers can expect when raiding a villain's lair. So, let's get to it. I will start with the adventurer's background first. Before he was ousted from his position as the open lord of Waterdeep, Dagolt Neverember embezzled half a million gold pieces from Waterdeep's treasury and hid them in a secret vault called the Vault of the Dragons. Built long ago by dwarves, the vault is warded against all forms of magical detection, scrying, and intrusion. As a security precaution, he arranged all knowledge of the vault's location and defenses to be magically erased from his mind and the minds of his subordinates. The wizard who performed the procedure trapped this knowledge within an artifact called the Stone of Galore. The wizard disappeared shortly thereafter and Dagolt hid the stone in the palace of Waterdeep. The Stone of Galore ends up being the MacGuffin plot device for the adventure. Dagolt was in the city of Neverwinter when the other Lords of Waterdeep voted him out of office. He immediately made plans to retrieve the Stone of Galore and smuggle his personal wealth out of Waterdeep. His spies retrieved the stone from the palace, but were intercepted and killed while trying to leave the city. The stolen stone was passed from one hand to another like a common jewel 
until it wound up in the clutches of the Xanathar guild. The Stone of Galore is actually an aboleth transformed by magic. In this inanimate state, the aboleth can read the mind of any creature that attunes to the stone, as well as modify that creature's memory. A creature attuned to the stone can also extract information from the aboleth, including lore about Neverember's vault. At the base of Undermountain and where it meets the sea, there is a subterranean city called Skullport. It is a den to the criminal underworld of Waterdeep. Its most powerful crime lord is a beholder called Xanathar. Hoping to gain a political foothold in Waterdeep, agents of the Xantarum recently tried to ally their organization with the Xanathar Guild. The architect of this attempt was a clone of the wizard Manchun, a founder of the Xantarum long thought dead. While the two sides were negotiating in Xanathar's lair, the Stone of Galore was again stolen from where Xanathar had hidden it. The paranoid beholder accused the Xantarum of stealing it and slew its envoys who were present. When the Zents retaliated by attacking Xanathar Guild outposts, Xanathar took their actions as confirmation that they had stolen it. Now the bad blood between the two factions has begun to spill into the streets, threatening the peace throughout the city of Waterdeep. Who actually stole the Stone of Galore? The answer, a rock gnome named Dalakar. After Lord Neverember used magic to discern the gemstone's location, he sent forth a succession of spies to infiltrate Xanathar's lair and obtain it. Dalakar succeeded where others before him had failed. However, his success will be short-lived. The fireball event in the flowchart will happen after the player characters have settled in their new home of Trollskull Manor. As stated before, the embezzled half a million gold pieces are in a secret vault called the Vault of the Dragons. Dagult Neverember managed to convince an adult gold dragon named Oranax to guard the gold until he returns. The Stone of Galore knows where the treasure vault is located, how to get inside, and that a gold dragon is guarding the treasure. To get such information requires one to attune to the stone. Displayed is the flowchart of adventures that are in Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Without going into too much detail in this video, I will briefly go over the sequence of events. My goal is to do a separate video on each of these adventures. In my Part 1 video, I have already discussed the A Friend in Need adventure. So, please, check it out! However, just to be thorough in this video, the first adventure for the player characters is a quest given to them by Volothomp Gedrom. It is to find and rescue his kidnapped friend, Floon Blagmar. As a reward, Volo will give the characters the deed to Trollskull Manor. During the course of rescuing Floon, the adventurers also rescue Lord Rainier Neverember the son of the ousted Open Lord. Because of this, the player characters are now known in Waterdeep, and have attracted the attention of a few factions. These various factions will try to recruit the player characters. Each faction has special missions, aka side quests, for those that join them. In the meantime, as the new owners of Trollskull Manor the player characters have the opportunity to settle down in their new home 
and to meet and get to know their neighbors. After some time, a fireball detonates in Cholskol Alley. This prompts an investigation by the Waterdeep authorities and also hurls the characters into conflict with some secondary villains, culminating in a bloody confrontation at a noble estate. The fireball incident also sets into motion the main plot of the adventure and puts the player characters on a collision course with those who want to find and claim Lord Never Ember's stolen and hidden cache of gold. Thus, the treasure hunt begins. In Chapter 4 of the adventure, the player characters race to find the gold. The encounters in this chapter and the order in which they occur change depending on the villain the Dungeon Master chooses for this adventure. The chapter concludes with the discovery of Lord Never Ember's treasure vault and a showdown with its guardian, the gold dragon, Oranax. The player character's ultimate goal is to prevent the gold from falling into the hands of the villains of the story. Chapters 5 through 8 provide descriptions of the villain's layers and can be used at any time and in any order. The player characters might have a reason to visit one or more of these layers in the course of the adventure. The Dungeon Master should be prepared to make adjustments on the fly and give hints where need be. Again, these villains are meant to be thwarted, not killed. Thwarting the villains does not require the characters to invade their layers or defeat them in combat. So, it is possible to complete the adventure without these chapters coming into play. Bear in mind, these villains do not want undue attention from Waterdeep's authorities. So, if forced into combat, they will try to knock the adventurers unconscious rather than kill them. Such characters might awaken in an alley, a sewer tunnel, or a prison cell, with or without their gear. Conversely, they might awaken safe and sound in a private residence and being cared for by friendly NPCs who took them in. In my Part 1 video, I have already discussed the joinable factions, but I have done so only briefly. I will now go into a little more detail on the factions. When necessary, factions can also provide aid to its members. Harpers are individual idealists who work behind the scenes to keep power out of the hands of evil tyrants. Any smart, non-evil character can join the Harpers, but they tend to attract more bards and wizards to join. The Harpers suspect that the Zentarum is wholly or partially responsible for the escalation of violence in Waterdeep. Harper spies might use the adventurers as instruments to get at the truth. The Harpers are not well organized and tend to be chaotic. They have several secret gathering places in Waterdeep, but at the same time, they may conduct their business in bustling inns and taverns. Various nobles and guildmasters in the city are Harper sympathizers. Rainier Neverember is a member of the Harpers. The Lord's Alliance is a confederation of cities and towns along the Sword Coast, including, among others, Waterdeep, Baldur's Gate, Mirabar, Mithril Hall, Neverwinter, and Silvery Moon. Members of the Alliance must come to one another's aid in times of need, and the organization uses field operatives such as diplomats, spies, and assassins to safeguard its interests. Waterdeep is one of the most influential and invested members of the Lord's Alliance. The Open Lord 
Laurel Silverhand takes an active role in managing and operating the Lord's Alliance within Waterdeep. Shalester Silvermane is a member of the Lord's Alliance. The order of the Gauntlet's mission is to seek out and destroy evil before it gains a foothold. Any non-evil character can join the order. Clerics, monks, and paladins are especially welcome, particularly if they worship Helm, Torm, or Tyr. They often act without waiting for the blessings of temples or the permission of rulers, which can put them at odds with those in power. The surge of violence in Waterdeep spurs members of the Order to find and recruit adventurers who can help return peace to the city. The Emerald Enclave's goal is to seek harmony between nature and civilization. Within the city walls of Waterdeep, the Emerald Enclave does not have too many members. The members that are in Waterdeep help guard the city against unnatural threats, including aberrations and undead. They also watch over the city's parks and the city of the dead. In order to join, a character must demonstrate an interest in protecting nature. Druids and rangers are especially welcome to join them. The highest member of the Emerald Enclave in Waterdeep is Lady Jarith Falcon. However, the real operations are handled by the half-elf druid Melanor Felbranch, Falcon's groundskeeper, and Blossom Snowbeetle, an elderly halfling druid. Her youngest son, Dasher, disappeared about six months ago. He was infected with lycanthropy and is now a member of the Shard Shunners, a halfling were-rat gang. The Centarm, also known as the Black Network, has an open recruitment policy. Anyone can join. It is a shadow organization that trades and traffics anything for profit, including mercenaries, weapons, slaves, illicit substances, and goods. It has long sought to gain political influence in Waterdeep, but the strength of the city's masked lords, nobility, and professional guilds makes that difficult. Currently, the Centaurum in Waterdeep is a fractured organization. Those who support Manchun, who is really a clone, want to destroy the Xenathar Guild and seize political and economic control of the city. Those who oppose Manchun want to expose and destroy him before they are themselves apprehended or driven out of the city by the local authorities. The player characters cannot join Manchun's side, but they can join and receive aid from the Zents who are opposed to him. The leaders of this branch are retired adventurers who have become business entrepreneurs. Their adventuring party was called the Doom Raiders because their specialty was plundering lich layers. They are desperately trying to gain a legitimate economic foothold in Waterdeep, which requires making alliances with local guilds and nobles. The group's leaders are Devil Starsong, Istrid Horn, Tashlin Yafera, Schemo Weirdbottle, and Siraj the Hunter. Manchun's war against the Xanathar Guild has thrown their plans into upheaval. Charlaxel Bainray leads the Renegade Dro faction known as the Brigand Dearth. It was originally made up of outcasts from destroyed and disgraced drow houses. A character must be a drow, preferably a male, to join the Brigand Dearth faction. Charlaxel Bainray is always looking for new members to fill in the ranks. His company takes more espionage-like missions 
over mercenary ones. The vast majority of Bregendorf members are male, because female drow rarely condescend to take orders from a male. A female drow has to convince Charlaxel that she would be an asset to the Brotherhood. Bregan Derth is using one of Charlaxel's legitimate business enterprises, the Sea Maidens Fair, as a front in Waterdeep. The Sea Maidens Fair consists of three carnival ships: the Eyecatcher, the Heartbreaker, and the Hellraiser. Crewed by disguised drow and a host of non-drow performers, such as musicians, acrobats, actors, and the like, all three ships are anchored in Waterdeep's harbor. The Eyecatcher is Jarlaxel's flagship. The ship's cargo consists mostly of wagons and floats. That can be hastily assembled and paraded through the city. The drow use these parades to draw attention away from their illicit activities. Bregan Derth is skilled at infiltrating criminal organizations. Xanathar's drow advisor, Narl Zebridas, is actually a Bregan Derth spy. To join Force Gray, one must first become a member of the Gray Hands, an individual who has served in the City Watch or the City Guard is eligible to join. As are characters who swear oaths to defend Waterdeep, its citizens, and its laws with their lives. Force Gray and the Gray Hands are actively managed by Vejra Safar. The Black Staff. Their job is to deal with threats to the city that the Guard and the Watch are not able to handle without risking significant loss of life. They are called upon only as a last resort, since the Lords of Waterdeep tend not to be fond of their methods. Force Gray is an elite cadre of specialized adventurers. Drawn from the ranks of the Gray Hands, whenever Waterdeep has a problem that cannot be handled by diplomats or the city's other armed forces, the Open Lord has the option to mobilize Force Gray. Such action is usually taken as a last resort, since some past members of the group have exhibited. A tendency to indulge in wanton violence, causing as much damage as they ostensibly prevent. Due to the escalating violence between the Centarm and the Sanathar Guild, Vejra Safar, the Black Staff, has activated Force Gray and the Gray Hands to deal with the problem. If members of Force Gray and, in some cases, the Gray Hands. Are arrested for a crime, the Open Lord or the Black Staff will usually intervene on their behalf and facilitate their release. The Xanathar Guild is Waterdeep's unofficial thieves' guild. Long ago, the original thieves' guild was outlawed and driven out. Anyone can join the Xanathar Guild. But before membership is granted, an applicant must pass a test that always involves a serious crime being committed. Xanathar's true nature is supposed to be a secret that hardly anyone in Waterdeep knows, save for a select few. Even the guild members do not know that their boss is a beholder. There are seven colorful NPCs the player characters can interact with at the Yawning Portal Tavern. Some are already members of certain factions and thus can influence the player characters to join their factions. The tavern's owner is Dornan, and he is a man of few words. He is a retired adventurer. 
and does not often venture far from the yawning portal. The barmaid Bonnie is actually a doppelganger and is the leader of five doppelgangers. She works at the tavern to make ends meet for her and her gang. Right now, only Matrim Three Strings knows she is a doppelganger. In terms of trustworthiness, only Bonnie can be trusted. The rest of the doppelgangers cannot be trusted. Matrim Three Strings Mareg is a bard that often performs at the tavern. He is a spy for the Harpers and is not open about it. He mainly spies on Zentarum agents and on other potential troublemakers. He recently befriended Bonnie and wants to help her doppelganger gang settle into the city. The fighter Jalester Silvermane is an agent of the Lord's Alliance and reports directly to the Open Lord Laurel Silverhand. Since the Yawning Portal attracts adventurers, Jalester's task is to spy on them and discern who might aid or imperil the city and its citizens. Dornan knows that Jarlester works for Laurel and leaves him alone. Melun Wardragon seems like a cheery, optimistic, warm-hearted man. Many at the tavern know he is a skilled fighter and has ties to Force Grey. However, many months ago, an intellect devourer took control of Melun and ate his brain. The Intellect Devourer controlled Melun now spies for the Xenathar Guild. For the Guild, he hunts down and kills Xentarim operatives, but only does this clandestinely. Ubaya Yude is from the southern lands of Chult and is a priestess of Waikin. How much help she provides the player characters is up to the Dungeon Master. She is meant to play a more prominent role in the Waterdeep Dungeons of the Mad Mage adventure. Yagra Stonefist is a half-orc Zentarum mercenary. Her current assignment is to protect an elf named Davil Starsong. Davil Starsong and his former adventuring party called the Doom Raiders now jointly lead the Zentarum faction that opposes Manchun's faction. Since Davil prefers diplomacy over conflict, Yagra finds her current job boring. If the characters express their opposition to the Xenathar Guild, Yagra might urge them to speak to Davil about joining forces with the Zentarum. The Dungeon Master decides who the main villain of the adventure is. There are four villains to choose from. The villain chosen opposes the player characters while the other villains become part of the backdrop and could help or hinder the characters. The villains are after the treasure hoard and the player character's ultimate goal is to keep the treasure out of their clutches. Choosing a villain also determines which season the adventure takes place in. However, the Dungeon Master is free to change villains without changing the season any time he or she wishes to. Xenathar is a paranoid, megalomaniacal, beholder crime lord. Xenathar believes the Xentarm stole the Stone of Galore from his lair. Thus, he has open hostilities with them and seeks to wipe them out. Like all other villains, he wants to retrieve the Stone of Galore and to secure the Cache of Gold. His base of operations is a dungeon under Skullport. Skullport is a gang and crime-infested subterranean settlement beneath Waterdeep. Xenathar has a healthy fear of Laurel Silverhand, does not want to provoke a conflict with the Open Lord of Waterdeep, and is inclined to spare those in her employ. If the DM chooses Xenathar as the villain, 
Then the adventure takes place in the spring. Victaro and Amelia Castellanter are Waterdavian nobles and are secret worshippers of Asmodeus. Three years ago, the devil-worshipping Castellanterns traded the souls of their children in exchange for power and to escape financial ruin. The eldest son, Osvaldo's soul, was taken immediately and transformed into a chain devil. The castle lanterns keep Osvaldo locked up in their attic. Their two youngest children, Terenzio and Alzarina, are doomed to lose their souls when they turn nine years old, which is not too far away. The castle lanterns plan to use the cash of gold to buy back the souls of their two remaining children. Actually, a half a million gold pieces is not enough. They need almost a million gold pieces, and they need to sacrifice 99 souls. From their own funds and with the embezzled gold, they will have more than enough for the gold payment. For the 99 souls, they plan on poisoning the food of an upcoming feast that they will be hosting. Their estate, Castle Lantern Villa, has a temple of Asmodeus hidden underneath it. Victaro and Amalia rely on their noble status to protect them, and the last thing they want is the city watch on their doorstep. Thus, they will try to misdirect and discredit the player characters rather than murder them. If the DM chooses the Castle Lanterns as the villains, then the adventure takes place in the summer. Charlexel Bainray is a flamboyant drow swashbuckler. Those who have read the Dritz novels will be familiar with this drow. He is extremely cunning, intelligent, and devious. This villain will probably be the hardest to convincingly run only if your players are very familiar with the Dritz novels and are avid fans of them. Luskin is a pirate city far to the north. Charlaxel managed to effectively gain control of the city over its pirate lords. He wants Luskin to join the Confederation of the Lords Alliance and oust Neverwinter from it. He plans to use the stolen gold to buy his way into the Lord's Alliance. Charlaxel also wants the Dragonstaff of Ahgeron for leverage in his negotiations. The Dragonstaff is currently in the possession of the gold dragon Oranax. Charlaxel wears a hat of disguise. He often uses it to be in the magical guise of a flamboyant human sea captain named Zardos Zord. As Captain Zardos Zord, Charlaxel runs a traveling carnival called the Sea Maiden's Fair. Charlaxel layers and oversees things from the eyecatcher, his flagship, and the Scarlet Marpanoth which is a submarine that is mounted underneath it. Because he is well versed in the arts of espionage, Charlaxel loves complicating matters and delights in thwarting his enemies. If the DM chooses Charlaxel as the villain, then the adventure takes place in the autumn season. The original wizard Manchun was one of the founders of the Centaurum. The one in this adventure is a clone and is hiding in Waterdeep. He has many enemies, including the Harpers, the Blackstaff, Elminster of Shadowdale, amongst others. Thus, he needs to operate from the shadows. He wants to rule Waterdeep as a tyrant. His plan is to get the cash of gold and use it to bribe the Mask Lords into making him the new Open Lord. In addition, he wants to regain control of the Centaurum faction. 
mansion lurks in Colot Towers, which is a pair of wizard's towers in the Trades Ward of Waterdeep. Mansion creates copies of himself using Simulacrum's spell. He takes great pains to conceal his identity since his success hinges on not attracting the attention of others who would seek to thwart him before his plans come to fruition. He avoids unnecessary confrontations with adventurers. Only those who enter his extra-dimensional sanctum are likely to incur his wrath. If the DM chooses Manchun as the villain, then the adventure takes place in the winter. Thwarting the villains does not require the player characters to invade their lairs and or defeat them in combat. So, it is possible to complete this adventure without directly fighting the main villains who are much more powerful than the player characters and probably could TPK them easily, even if they were to reach 5th level. That is what I like about this adventure. A world and setting seems more real when characters face encounters that are too easy and encounters where the wisest course of action is to Of course, most encounters should be appropriate for the player character's current levels. Anyway, because the villains do not want to attract undue attention, they are rarely spoiling for a fight. If a confrontation does occur, the adventurers can be knocked unconscious rather than be killed. Now that I have covered the adventure's background, setup, and initial quest, I can now move on to the next set of adventures in the Waterdeep Dragon Heist Adventure Book. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment. I do like feedback. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. I just can't let you go Lord knows that I've tried to You said I was the only one No one likes being lied to You made this mess and left me with the pieces Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us
Hello, and greetings, lovely person, from RPG Mods Fan. This video is part 3 of my walkthrough and review of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Waterdeep Dragon Heist. In order not to repeat myself too much, I would highly recommend watching my part 1 and part 2 videos, which covers the adventure's setup, background, and initial quest before watching this video. In this video, I will be going over the adventure book's second adventure titled Troll Skull Alley. I am the evil dungeon master, and my mule, <coughs> I mean my assistant, RPG Modsman, will be discussing the adventure itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Excuse me while I go and TPK my group of players. <laughs> Previously on Waterdeep Dragon Heist, famed explorer, raconteur, and author Volothomp Gedrom sent our band of fearless adventurers on a quest to find and rescue his kidnapped friend, Flume Blagmar. The handsome simpleton Flume had the misfortune of being mistaken for his friend, Renair Neverember the estranged son of the ousted former open lord of Waterdeep, Dagolt Neverember. Floon was kidnapped by the Xantarum and taken to their hideout in the Dock Ward. Then the Xenathar gang thugs raided the hideout and took Floon to their hideout in the Dock Ward. Our band of fearless adventurers were able to find and rescue Floon and bring him back to Volo. As a reward for rescuing Flume, Volo gives the adventurers the deed to Trollskull Manor. During their course of rescuing Flume, the adventurers also rescue Lord Rainier Neverember. Because of this, the player characters are now known in Waterdeep and have attracted the attention of a few factions. These various factions will try to recruit the player characters. Each faction has special missions, aka side quests, for those that join them. In the meantime, as the new owners of Trollskull Manor, the player characters have the opportunity to settle down in their new home, and to meet and to get to know their neighbors. Trollskull Manor is located in the North Ward on Serdon Street. The building not only looks out onto the street, but also an alleyway known as Trollskull Alley. The displayed map shows the location of Trollskull Manor. It used to be a tavern with a residence on the upper floors. The tavern has been closed for years. The building needs repair, and the manor is haunted by a poltergeist. Okay, time to meet the neighbors. Building number T2 is the Bent Nail. This shop sells wooden weapons and shields, as well as custom-made furniture and wood sculptures. The owner, carpenter, and wood carver is a male half-elf named Tally Sovenar. Fellbranch, or Tally for short. The adventure book does not state whether Melanor Fellbranch of the Emerald Enclave and Tally are related. Building number T3 is the blacksmith called Steam and Steel. This shop sells and crafts all manner of metal weapons, shields, and armor. The forge is owned and run by a married couple named Embrick a fire genasi, and Avi, a water genasi. 
building number T4, is a shop called Corellon's Crown. An androgynous wood elf herbalist and druid named Fala Le Falier operates the shop. Fala is friends with Ziraj, who is a member of the Centarm and was part of the Doom Raiders adventuring party. Ziraj visits Fala from time to time. In addition to herbs and flowers, Fala also sells a variety of potions. Building number T5 has an orange and black sign featuring a cat's eye. Here, Vincent Trench runs his private eye business called the Tiger's Eye. The door is always locked and visitors must knock or ring the bell before being let in. For a fee, the player characters can hire Mr. Trench to find out information. In case the player characters are unable to move forward in the adventure, the Tiger's Eye can be used. Also, should the Dungeon Master wish and the player characters have befriended Vincent, the Tiger's Eye could be used as a source of side quests. Actually, Vincent Trench is really a Rakshasa named Valan Tajar, who has grown accustomed to living among mortals and is rather fond of Waterdeep and its citizens. Building number T6 is a bookshop called Bookworm's Treasure. It is managed by a dragonborn mage named Rishal the Page Turner. Although he has spellbooks, he does not sell them. However, he allows mages to copy spells from them at a cost. In addition, he can scribe any of these spells onto a scroll but charges twice the listed cost for this service. The Dungeon Master can pick any of the unmarked buildings in Trollskull Alley to be the relatively recently opened Franz Bruise. My choice would be a building at the south center of the alley. A salty person named Emek Fron tried to buy Trollskull Manor, but he was outbid by Volo. Stung by this loss, he bought a smaller, less impressive building and turned it into a pub. The Dungeon Master can add other shops to the area as well, such as a baker, a tailor, etc. Trollskull Manor was once the grandest building in Trollskull Alley. Now it is an abandoned building. It is four stories tall and has balconies, a turret, and five chimneys. Characters can refurbish, rebuild, rename, and otherwise personalize their new strongholds to their heart's content. Haunting the manor is a poltergeist named Lif. Lif was the tavern's barkeeper. The player characters can either appease or destroy Lif. If the player characters work to repair and renovate the tavern with the goal of opening it to the public again, this will appease Lif and he will accept them as the new owners. Once the business is up and running, Lif can also perform helpful functions such as sweeping floors, pouring beer, and so forth. If the characters intend to fix up and reopen the tavern, they can expect to deal with various guilds without whose support the business is likely to fail. Repairs to the walls and the roof require the approval and oversight of the carpenters, roofers, and plasterers guild. Hopefully the player characters have made friends with Tally at the Bent Nail who probably can help them in this area and with the guild. The Cellarers and Plumbers Guild for handling the refurbishment of the basement and the plumbing of the building in general. The streets around the establishment are kept up by the Dung Sweepers Guild and the Loyal Order of Street Laborers. Meat must come from the Guild of Butchers. Fish from the Fishmongers Guild. 
Wine and ale must come from the Vinters, Distillers, and Brewers Guild. And the list goes on. Hopefully, the player characters have made friends with Dornan, who can provide advice on these matters. Once it becomes known around the city that the tavern in Trollskull Manor is planning to reopen its doors to the public, the adventurers will receive visits from various guild representatives. Broxley Fairkettle from the Fellowship of Innskeepers will make a visit and will want the characters to join the guild. Hammond Craddock from the Venters Distillers and Brewers Guild will also pay a visit. Hammond tends to be hard to deal with. Justin Rask from the Guild of the Butchers will show up. The Guild does not pay him enough for him to afford a residence in the North Ward. Thus, going to that part of the city fills his heart with resentment. The Tavern Keeping Expenses sidebar lists the costs that the characters will need to pay to get their place ready for business and for running it. The running a business table determines how much profit or loss the tavern makes. Personally, I would increase the amount of profit if the characters are well liked as neighbors and or if they make the tavern unique in any way, such as having Liff serve as a bartender. If the player characters are on friendly terms with Dornan, then I would have Dornan Send them the skull of the troll as a housewarming gift. The one person that will not be happy about the tavern reopening is their business rival, Emek Froon. Financially, Emek is already on shaky ground. Yet, he will still take out a 150 gold pieces loan from Istrid Horn, who is from the Santarm faction and was part of the Doom Raiders party. He will pay 50 gold pieces to the halfling were-rat gang, the Shard Shunners, to ruin the character's tavern business. The actions the Shard Shunners take is outlined on the displayed table. As a dungeon master, I have my players create backup characters along with their main characters. As a DM, I would have Dernan hire the backup characters to deliver the skull of the troll that was defeated at the Yawning Portal to the main characters at their Troll Skull Manor residence as a housewarming gift. For this delivery quest, I would have the players play their backup characters. As a DM, I would also inject other opportunities for the main characters to interact with the backup characters. I do this in order to make a more smooth transition to a backup character if and when the need arises. I also do this in hopes of fostering an in-game bond between the main and backup characters. However, Waterdeep Dragonheist is not a deadly adventure if the player characters are smart and do not do too many stupid things. So, I hope you like these suggestions. The Harpers approach good aligned characters who show promise as spies. To one such character, they will send a paper bird with the following message. Rainier tells us you are a good bet. He brought you tickets to the opera tonight at the Lightsinger Theater in the Sea Ward. If you are interested, meet Mert at intermission, private box C. Formal attire is required for admittance. Mert will be the character's main contact with the Harpers, and he is the one who doles out missions to them. The Lord's Alliance want characters who place the security of the city ahead of their own interests. Shalester Silvermane will visit and ask to speak to those who he believes are such characters. Unlike the other factions, 
Assigned Lords Alliance missions are mandatory. Refusing to accept or complete a mission can result either in suspension or dismissal. The Order of the Gauntlet looks for members who seek to fight evil in all of its forms. If the party includes one or more likely recruits, Savra Bella Branta will come and pay a visit. She invites them to the Halls of Justice, which is a temple of Tyre, located in the castle ward. There they can be sworn into the order. After the ceremony, Savra gives the new recruits their first mission. The Emerald Enclave will send a white cat that has animal message cast on it to any nature-loving characters, such as druids, rangers, and like. The cats will speak the following words. Meow. Interested in joining the Emerald Enclave? Come meet us at Falcon Mere in the Southern Ward. Meow. At the Falcon Mere estate, Melanor Felbranch will meet with the characters. Displayed are the missions for characters who join the Emerald Enclave. The Doom Raiders try to contact evil aligned or morally ambiguous characters. A flying snake with a parchment tied about its body visits one character in the dead of night. The message reads, Want to be part of something big? Speak to Davil Starsong at the Yawning Portal. If the characters seek out Davil, Yagra Stonefist greets them and leads interested characters to a table in the center of the Yawning Portal's taproom, where her boss waits with a drink in hand. Devil offers membership in the faction to interested characters, then assigns them their first mission. Subsequent missions are written on scrolls and delivered by flying snakes. After the characters complete two missions, Davil is arrested by the City Watch and held in Castle Waterdeep for questioning. Until his release, Toshlin Yafira will be the one giving out further missions. Weeks after his arrest, Davil is released from custody once the Lords of Waterdeep are convinced that neither he nor his associates are responsible for the recent violence in the city. If there are any Drow player characters, Charlexel Bainre will have three of his lieutenants shadow them. Each day, the characters roll a DC 18 Wisdom Perception check to see if they notice that they are being followed. When notice, the lieutenants flee. On the next day, Charlaxel shows up in the guise of a human haberdasher and asks to meet with the drow characters in private. Missions for drow characters who join the Brigand Dearth is displayed on the screen. Vechra Safar, the Blackstaff, is friends with Rainier Never Ember, and word of his rescue quickly reached her ears. She uses a sending spell to deliver the following short message to one of the characters. I am Vajra Safar, the Blackstaff. Come to Blackstaff Tower in the Castle Ward at once. Bring your friends. At Blackstaff Tower, Vechra offers the characters membership in the Grey Hands. Characters that join will be given their first mission. For subsequent missions, she uses sending spells to dole them out. These missions are designed to tax the characters' resources and test their loyalty to Waterdeep. In order to raise money for their tavern business, the player characters will probably want to do as many faction missions as they can. However, the rewards in terms of gold pieces is relatively small. Basically, not enough to get the tavern up and running. So, the DM must decide 
if they are running a more realistic campaign or more of a fantasy campaign and adjust the rewards accordingly. I probably should do separate videos on each faction's missions. I will contemplate on doing so depending on how well received these Waterdeep Dragon Heist videos are. After the player characters have completed a few missions, as a Dungeon Master, I would have Volo come to visit. Since the time they initially met at the Yawning Portal, Volo was able to collect some gold. He will then offer to pay each of the characters the previously agreed upon 100 gold pieces for rescuing Floon in exchange for getting back the deed to Trollskull Manor. To me, this will make the adventure more realistic. I do not think the characters will take Volo up on his offer, and Volo will not be offended by this, and adds that he cannot wait to see what they will do to the place. The adventure states to advance the player characters to third level once they have completed a few faction missions or dealt with Emek Froon. This part of the adventure was meant as an opportunity for the player characters to make friends and gain a reputation, whether for good or ill, in Trollskull Alley and in Waterdeep itself, before the events of the next chapter embroil them in a greater plot. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment. I do like feedback. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye.
Hello, and greetings, lovely person from RPG Mods fan. This video is part 4 of my walkthrough and review of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons adventure, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. In order not to repeat myself too much, I would highly recommend watching my part 1, 2, and 3 videos before watching this video. In this video, I will be going over the adventure book's third adventure titled Fireball. I am the evil dungeon master, and my thrall, RPG Mods fan, will be discussing the adventure itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Excuse me while I go and TPK my group of players. <laughs> Previously on Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the famous explorer and author Volothump Gedram gives our band of fearless adventurers a quest to find and rescue his kidnapped friend Floon Blagmar. Floon was kidnapped by the Zentarum, then again by the Xanathar Guild. During their quest, they also rescue Lord Renair Neverember. Volo awards our adventures with the Troll Skull Manor Estate, located in the North Ward. The adventurers settle into their new home and meet their neighbors. Rescuing Rainier has made them known in Waterdeep, and has brought them the attention of various factions. These factions then try to persuade the adventurers to join them. One early morning, when all the player characters are in their Trollskull Manor, they hear the roar of an explosion, their windows rattle, followed by the screams of city folk, all coming from Trollskull Alley. A fireball has detonated in the street claiming the lives of 11 people. The player characters have a few minutes to examine the crime scene before the city guards arrive, who will then cordon off Trollskull Alley with six guards at each entrance. Another six guards and their sergeant watch over the crime scene. Flying overhead in the sky is a griffin mounted by a griffin cavalry rider. About 15 minutes later, 22 members of the City Watch arrive to investigate the crime scene. They are led by Sergeant Saith Cromley and Barnabas Blaswind. Barnabas is a member of the Watchful Order of Magus and Protectors. 20 City Watch constables will be knocking on doors and questioning locals. The victims of the blast were as follows. In plain clothes, two female humans and one male half-elf. They were servants of wealthy Northward families who were running errands for them. Two female halflings. One was playing a flute and the other was playing a fiddle. Two male halflings who were dancing to their tune. One elderly female human who was out for a walk. Two cloaked, leather armor clad male human sellswords. They have tattoos of a black winged snake, which is the symbol of the Zentarum, and a male rock gnome. The male gnome was Dalakar, who had the Stone of Galore and was on his way to see the player characters at their Trollskull Manor home. He also has a pouch containing five 100 gold piece gemstones. The DC Dexterity Sleight of Hand check for snatching the pouch with no one noticing is 13. 
as a dungeon master, I would also add a parchment with the address of Trollskull Manor or a map to it. Somehow this parchment survived the blast. Perhaps it was tucked in a small, non-flammable scroll case? Upon inspection of the crime scene, Barnabas comes to the following conclusions. The gnome was running away from three armed pursuers. Two are dead, but the third person survived and is no longer at the scene. The gnome and his pursuers were moving toward Trollskull Manor. Hence, he and Sergeant Cromley will want to question the player characters. Neither the gnome nor his pursuers saw the blast coming. Both Barnabas and Sergeant Cromley prefer to have ironclad evidence and testimony from reliable witnesses before making any arrests. However, they will refuse any requests by the player characters to join in on the investigation. There were many eyewitnesses to the fireball blast. Three of them have important information to share. No ability checks are required by the player characters to question them. Fala Le Falier, the owner of Corellon's crown, saw a badly burned cloaked man taking something from the body of the dead gnome and then limped away toward the bent nail. Chesreen Hornraven hired Vincent Trench to spy on her philandering husband. As she left the tiger's eye, she saw a puppet shaped like a man on a rooftop hurl something into the crowd below that caused the explosion. A 12-year-old boy named Martem Trek was watching the halflings. Moments after the blast, a necklace of fireballs fell into the rain barrel Martem was hiding behind. The necklace has a broken clasp and two beads left. Player characters who withhold from the city watch the necklace and or any items taken from the crime scene are technically guilty of withholding evidence, which is a crime in Waterdeep. The bodies will be taken to the cellar morgue of a nearby City Watch station. If the characters manage to have Speak With Dead cast on Dalakar, they can learn the following information. Dalakar worked for the Open Lord of Waterdeep, who he thinks is Lord Dagolt Neverember. For him, Dalakar stole the Stone of Galore from Xanathar's lair. The Stone of Galore is the key to finding a hoard of gold hidden in the city by Dagolt, never ember. Delacar heard about the adventures and thought they can keep the stone safe from his pursuers. If the characters manage to have Speak With Dead cast on the Centaurum sellswords, they can learn the following information. They've worked for Erstel Fluxen, and resided at Grauhond's villa. Their job was to catch Delacar. Delacar had some kind of artifact in his possession which, according to Erstel Fluxen, would make them as rich as kings. So, here is what exactly happened. If you are piecing the pieces together, you probably already figured out most of it. Delacar, a rock gnome who stole the Stone of Galore from Xanathar's lair, is a spy working for the ousted lord Dagolt Neverember. Delacar was being hounded by agents of the Centaurum, the Xanathar Guild, and the Brigand Earth. He was unable to escape from Waterdeep with the artifact. So, he planned to entrust it to the player characters briefly. His reasoning being that the folk who rescued Lord Never Ember's son could keep it safe where he could not. He was on his way to see the player characters when the fireball went off, killing him and ten other people. 
Close on his heels were three members of Manchun's Zentarum faction. The one who survived the blast is an assassin named Erstel Fluxen. Erstel Fluxen was the cloaked man Falas saw, as well as seeing him take the Stone of Galore from Dalakar's dead body. Ursul stumbled through the smoke and haze and eventually made his way back to Grauhund's villa. In exchange for a share of the hidden cache of gold, Lord Orond and Lady Yalla Grauhund were providing coin and aid to Ursul and his fellow Zents. Orond and Yalla are the heads of the Grauhund noble family and are secret Asmodeus worshippers. They make their money by trading arms and mercenaries. However, the Grauhons do not fully trust the Zents. So, they sent out their own agent to shadow the Zents, eliminate Dalakar, and obtain the Stone of Galore on their behalf. The Grauhund's assassin is a construct called a nimble right. This puppet-like construct is what Jezreen Hornraven saw. A month ago, this nimble right escaped from a temple dedicated to Gond, called the House of Inspired Hands, located in the Sea Ward. For its task, the nimble right was given a necklace of fireballs. When it seemed as though Delacar might elude Erstel Fluxen, the nimble right hurled one of the necklace's beads to stop the gnome in his tracks. The fireball incident has now strained the alliance between the Gralhons and Manchun's Zentarum. Ursul is refusing to hand over the Stone of Galore until he first speaks to his master, Manchun. Meanwhile, the Grauhuns are weighing the risks of betraying and murdering Erstel in their own house. If the investigation of the player characters stall, friendly NPCs might step forward to help as well as factions the characters are members of. Once every autumn in Waterdeep, the Temple of Gond sponsors the Day of Wonders Parade which practically every resident of Waterdeep knows about. Oftentimes, automatons march in this parade. Hence, the player characters are expected to visit the House of Inspired Hands. The House of Inspired Hands looks like a cross between a temple and a workshop. Nim, a Nimrite, is hiding in the attic. It made a copy of itself, which then escaped. Actually, Nimrites are constructed by a wizard on the Lantan Islands. Inside the temple, the player characters will be greeted by Valata, a dragonborn priestess. Unless you have players who love to derail your adventures, most likely they will get to meet Nim with the help of Valata who understands Nim's sign language that it uses to communicate. From this encounter, the player characters will gain a nimble right detector. This 30 centimeter long copper contraption will start making noise, meaning its umbrella portion will start spinning, whirling, and clicking. When it comes within 500 feet or 152 meters, of a nimble right. The detector will make more noise the closer it gets to a nimble right. Nim's errant nimble right is in Grauhund Villa. However, there are four more nimble rights in Waterdeep. They are on board Captain Zardos Zord's three carnival ships harbored in the dock ward. If the player characters somehow get distracted and end up there, instead of Grauhund's villa, then Captain Zardos invites them to dine with him. He will say that he bought the nimble rights from a wizard on the Lantan Islands. 
he will add that his nimble rights are for his sea maidens fair. Finally, he will say that outside of the parade, his nimble rights always remain aboard his ships. They are perfectly harmless and are not responsible for the fireball blast. When news of the fireball blast and the news that a gnome and two sellswords were killed by it, Rainier Neverember will come to pay a visit to the player characters at Trollskull Manor. When that news hits Rainier is up to the DM. He will state that the gnome Dalakar was a spy for his father, and he will explain what he suspects happened. Basically, this is where the player characters get more of the adventure's background information. If the player characters share the information Fala La Falir told them, Rainier says he will make some inquiries with his contacts, which are the Harpers. A day later, Rainier returns and says the man Fala saw was Ursul Fluxen and that he was seen entering Grauhond Villa. After fleeing Trollskull Alley with the Stone of Galore, Ursul Fluxen returned to Grauhond Villa to confront Yala Grauhond about sending the Nimble Rite to meddle in his mission. Due to his injuries, Lady Grauhond decides to take advantage of his weakened condition and wrests the Stone of Galore from him. She then orders her guards to lock him up. Yala's motivation depends on the main villain that the Dungeon Master has chosen for the adventure. If Xanathar is the main villain, Yala will return the Stone to the Beholder in exchange for a vacancy being created on the Council of Masked Lords. If the Castle Lanterns are the main villains, Yala is a fawning member of their Asmodeus worshipping cult. If Charlaxel is the main villain, then he and Yala are secret lovers. If Manchun is the main villain, Yella believes Ursul can no longer be trusted and wants to deal with Manchun himself. While being taken away, Ursul manages to overpower the two guards watching over him and alerts the other Zents on the estate. Hence, the struggle between the Garhund household and the Zentaran begins. In the meantime, Lady Gralhond orders her nimble right to take the Stone of Galore elsewhere. Amid the chaos, the nimble right flees the estate. The player characters should now have a choice to share what they know to the City Watch or investigate Gralhond's villa themselves. But I ask you, what is the fun in sharing information with the City Watch? So, I will discuss the latter case where the characters try to infiltrate the villa. Grauhond Villa is enclosed by a 12 foot or 3.6 meter high stone walls. Neighbors and bystanders will alert the city watch if they hear loud disturbing noises such as a thunder wave spell coming from the estate or if they see anything suspicious. When the characters first arrive, the Zents have taken over the downstairs level of the mansion and have killed off most of the household servants. The Grauhunds are fighting to hold the upstairs. Area labeled G2 is the well-tended yard of the estate. During the day, the groundskeeper, Herv Talred, and his two mastiffs will be here. During the night, the three will transform into shadows. Room number G8 is the Great Hall. The bloody corpses of eight guards and two thugs lie on the floor. Guarding the room are two centarm thugs.
the sound of fighting can be heard coming from the top of a wide staircase. At the upstairs foyer, which is labeled G13, a battle rages between three Zentarm thugs and four house guards, and the floor is strewn with dead bodies. Rooms labeled G15, A, and B are the guest suite. Lord Orond Grauhond has barricaded himself in room G15B. The wounded Ersto Fluxen is in room G15A, trying to kick open the door to room G15B. If the player characters attack Ersto, he will attempt to flee. Lord Orond Grauhond will be relatively easy to intimidate for information and the player characters can pry the following information. The Stone of Galore is an ancient being transformed into an artifact and it knows the location of a hidden vault containing half a million gold pieces. House Grauhond has been bankrolling the Zentarum operations in Waterdeep, including the plot to kidnap Rainier Neverember and to steal the stone from his father's gnome spy, Dalakar. Lady Yala was frustrated with the Zent's inability to get the stone, so she sent her Nimblerite out to retrieve it. Ursto Fluxen basically knows the same information, but prying information from him will be more difficult. Yala Grauhond and her half-orc bodyguard are in the master bedroom. If her situation turns dire, Yala will flee into room G18, where her two children are, and make her last stand there. Even if the bloody conflict at Grauhond's villa goes unnoticed outside the walls of the estate, the carnage cannot be hidden from the city watch for too long. There are too many murdered servants and guards for anyone to conceal what has transpired. Eventually, the city watch along with Barnabas Blastwind and Saith Cromley, will arrive to investigate. They will question neighbors and bystanders. If any of them witness the player characters entering or leaving the estate, they become suspects and then can expect a visit from Barnabas and Saith. If any of the Grauhunts were killed, and there are witnesses or evidence of the player characters being at the villa, then the City Watch will then set out to arrest them. Within days after the events that local broadsheets dub the Grauhond Villa Bloodbath, the City Watch cracks down on the Centaurum. They round up as many Centaurum members they can find, including Davil Starsong. Characters who are members of the faction are safe for the time being as long as they keep a low profile. Otherwise, they too are rounded up and questioned over a period of several days. Istrid Horn of the Doom Raiders will contact and ask the player characters if she can hide at their place Trollskull Manor for 10 days. If the player characters do hide her, no one will come looking for her at Trollskull Manor, but her bad manners may irritate them. If you are using Milestone Level Advancement, the adventure states to level up the characters to fourth level if they have conducted their own investigation into the fireball incident and have affected the outcome of events in Grauhond Villa. So, what happened to the Nimblerite with the Stone of Galore? Where did it go? Find out next time on Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Thank, Thank you for, for watching. watching. Hope, Hope this, this video has, has been informative and entertaining. entertaining. Please, Please subscribe, subscribe, like, share, and, and comment. comment. 
I do like feedback. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye.
Wabbit season. Duck season. Wabbit season. Duck season. Wabbit season. Duck season. Wabbit season. Duck season. Hello, and greetings, lovely person from RPG Mods Fan. This video is part 5 of my walkthrough and review of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons adventure, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. In order not to repeat myself too much, I would highly recommend watching my parts 1 to 4 videos before watching this video. In this video, I will be going over the adventure book's 4th chapter titled Dragon Season. By this point in the adventure, the player characters should be at 4th or 5th level. The Waterdeep Dragon Heist story pretty much concludes in this chapter. I am the evil Dungeon Master, and my thrall, RPG Mods fan, will be discussing the adventure itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a Dungeon Master, who will be running this adventure for their players, or are a player who already played through this adventure and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Excuse me while I go and TPK my group of players. <laughs> Previously on Waterdeep Dragon Heist, the famous explorer, author, and raconteur Volothump Gedram gives our band of fearless adventurers a quest to find and rescue his kidnapped friend, Floon Blagmar. In a case of mistaken identity, Floon was first kidnapped by the Xantarn, then again by the Xanathar Guild. During their quest, they also rescue Lord Rainier Neverember. Volo awards our adventurers with the Trollskull Manor Estate, located in the North Ward. The adventurers settle into their new home and meet their neighbors. Rescuing Rainier has made them known in Waterdeep, and has brought them the attention of various factions. These factions then try to persuade the adventurers to join them. One early morning, the player characters hear the roar of an explosion, their windows rattle, followed by the screams of city folk, all coming from Trollskull Alley. A fireball has detonated in the street, claiming the lives of eleven people. This prompts an investigation by our merry band of adventurers, where they discover the explosion was caused by a Nimblerite that had a necklace of fireballs. The Nimblerite's owner was Lady Yala Gralhaunt, and its mission was to obtain the Stone of Galore. The investigation and events accumulate into a bloody confrontation at the Gralhond Noble Estate. However, the Nimblerite has escaped the estate with the stone and was instructed with one last mission. It is now up to our band of fearless adventurers to find the Nimblerite and the Stone of Galore. At this point in the adventure, the weather turns harsh. If the adventure is being run in the spring season, then the following weather effects are in play. Heavy rain falls from noon until midnight. From midnight until noon, the city is engulfed in a thick fog. If the adventure is being run in the summer season, then there will be a heat wave. If it is autumn,
the city will be very windy. If it is winter, the weather will be extremely cold and there will be a blizzard raging. Where the nimble right delivers the Stone of Galore depends on the season slash main villain of the adventure. When the player characters finally find the nimble right, it is hiding under a pile of uncollected garbage in an alley. With nowhere to go and no other purpose, it fights until it is destroyed. On the nimble right, the player characters will find a folded up map marking where it delivered the stone. If Xenathar is the main villain, the nimble right delivered the Stone of Galore to Grinda Garloth in the Mist Shore neighborhood of the Dock Ward. Grinda is a mage. If the Castle Lanterns are the villains, the Nimble Rites delivered the stone to the Castle Lantern family mausoleum in the City of the Dead. If Charlaxel is the villain, the stone was delivered to Fenris Stormcastle, who lives in an alley in the Trades Ward. Fenris works as a lamplighter and is a retired brigand. If Manchun is the villain, the stone was delivered to a dragonborn butcher named Thoracus in the Field Ward, where he has a butcher shop. The adventure book details out 10 encounters. For each season, 8 encounters compromise the player character's hunt for the Stone of Galore and of the Vault of the Dragons. They form a chain and their order depends on the chosen season slash villain. This was done to make this adventure replayable. Although the encounters themselves are not complex, running them will be a challenge because of having to constantly flip back and forth as the players progress. The first link in the encounter chain takes place where the nimble right left the stone. The next five links are either the player characters hunting for or chasing after the stone. Generally, by the sixth link, the player characters finally get possession of the stone. The seventh link in the encounter chain is either the villain's or the player character's last chance to get the stone. Basically, the Stone of Galore keeps getting passed on from one encounter to the next like a rugby ball or like an American football. By attuning to the stone, a character will learn where the vaults of the dragons lie, and this will be the last encounter in the chain. The adventure book does state, quote, Do not feel bound by an encounter chain. Let the character's decisions and actions drive the story. You can change the order in which encounters happen. Remove encounters you do not need or create new encounters. I will now be briefly discussing each encounter chain. For each chain, I should do a more detailed video, which would be quite a task. Anyway. In order to understand these encounters more easily, I put together tables for each encounter outlining monsters and NPCs encountered, special plot points, where the stone is, and other pertinent information. For those who are interested, I am making this Dungeon Master's Aid available for my patrons on Patreon. Please note that this is meant as a DM aid only, and does not contain maps or art. Basically, if you do not have a copy of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, this aid will seem like gibberish. I will now discuss the Spring Encounter Chain. The Stone of Galore was originally snatched from Xanathar. The Eye Tyrant wants it back. 
it will send its minions and monsters to do its dirty work. Lady Yala Growlon's nimble right delivers the Stone of Galore to Grinda Garloth, who lives in the Mist Shore neighborhood of the Dock Ward. Grinda is a mage and a mad treasure hunter, and she has worked for Xanathar in the past. She lives in the Dock Ward at building numbered D2. She got greedy and decided to keep the stone for herself instead of handing it over to the Xanathar Guild. To take the stone by force, the Xanathar Guild sent four human bandits and a Maro who was swimming in the waters. They are led by Noska Urgre, a dwarf. After the player characters defeat these attackers, they learn that Grinda told her rat familiar to hide the stone in her family's crypt in the City of the Dead. From this point on, the characters are followed by a gazer, through whose eyes Xanathar can see. The gazer stays out of any fights and tries to remain unseen. Lasser Merklov, a male halfling necromancer, and his two grave robbers have already raided the Garloth family mausoleum, killed the rat, and taken away the stone. However, a clue was left behind that will lead the characters to an old windmill in the southern ward. As the player characters emerge from the mausoleum, Five Durgar, who are members of the Xanathar Guild, attack them. They believe the characters have the stone. At the old windmill, Lasser's two grave robbers can be easily compelled to inform the characters that Lasser has the stone and that he can be found in a cellar complex that is in the trade's ward. When the player characters arrive, they find Lasser menaced by three Kanku working for the Xanathar Guild. Prior to the character's arrival, a Kanku has already gotten the stone from Lasser and has fled the scene. So, the chase begins. The chase through the streets happens during Trolltide a springtime holiday that is very similar to Halloween's trick-or-treat. Children are running around wearing troll masks. The Kanku with the stone then ducks into an old tower. When the player characters obtain the stone from the Kanku, they are then attacked by three gazers. As the player characters are moving through an alley, the Xanathar Guild makes one last attempt to get the stone by sending a force of eight kobolds dressed as children, one intellect devourer, and one bugbear named Morga who was leading this force. By attuning to the stone, a character will learn that the vault of the dragons lies beneath the pink flump theater in the castle ward. As Waterdeep contends with the sweltering summer heat, the Castle Lanterns send disciples of their Asmodeus worshipping cult to seize the Stone of Galore. The Nimblerite delivers the Stone of Galore to the Castle Lantern family mausoleum in the City of the Dead. Five cultists entered and two left. The ones who left have the stone and have taken it to an old windmill in the southern ward, which is their residence. When the player characters arrive at the mausoleum, they will find two dead cultist bodies. The third body was left for dead. This survivor reveals that these cultists were betrayed by two of their own and reveals the location of the old windmill. Three spined devils arrive at the same time as the player characters arrive at the old windmill. 
Just as the characters break into the cultist's apartment, the spine devils swoop in, snatch the stone, and then flee, leading to a rooftop chase between the adventurers and the spined devils. The spined devils then duck into an alley. where a hire coach is waiting in the middle of it. The spine devils hand off the stone to the hire coach's passenger, Williford Crowell. Williford works as the Castle Lantern's valet and is a doppelganger taking the form of an elderly thiefling. The spined devils and three imps will attack the player characters as they enter the alley giving time for the hire coach to flee the scene. As the hire coach flees, a street chase ensues, but a crowd cuts off the hire coach's path. Hence, Williford leaps out and tries to lose himself in the crowd. In the confusion, street urchins are able to snatch the stone, most likely by pickpocketing Williford and disappear into the sewers. The characters catch up to the urchins in their cellar hideout and are able to obtain the stone. When the characters emerge from the sewers, they are arrested by the city watch for disturbing the peace, as well as any other crimes they have committed, and are taken into custody at the Dock Ward Courthouse. Williford will try to get the stone back. At the conclusion of events at the courthouse, the characters again have possession of the stone. By attuning to the stone, a character will learn that the Vault of the Dragons lies beneath an old tower in the Sea Ward. The tower belongs to a young noblewoman named Esveli Rosnar. When committing crimes, she dons on the costume of the Black Viper. The Black Viper was a notorious burglar, pickpocket, mugger, and assassin over a century ago. Esveli has recently adopted the Black Viper's persona to lead a secret life of crime. To me, for some reason, the Black Viper is one of the more memorable characters of the adventure. Maybe because she reminds me of the Queen of Swords character. I love that show and wish it had more than just one season. Thus, I would have the player characters meet her earlier in the adventure, such as during the course of a faction mission. Deception and misdirection are Jarlaxle's forte, and he likes to trick his rivals into working for him. In the Autumn Chain, he tries to steer the characters toward the Stone of Galore and lets them think they are always one step ahead. Drow player characters who are members of the Brigand Dearth might find their loyalty to the party put to the test. The Nimblerite delivers the Stone of Galore to Fenris Stormcastle, who is a lamplighter and a criminal. To make extra income, he thinks he is working as a spy for the city of Luskin, but in reality he is working for the Brigand Dearth. He lives in an alley in the Trades Ward. Fenris has hidden the stone on the top floor of an old tower in the Dock Ward before he was arrested and taken to the Castle Ward Courthouse. When the characters enter Fenris' home, they will find it ransacked. It was ransacked by Durgar while searching for the stone. The Durgar work for the Xanathar Guild and layer in a cellar complex in the Southern Ward. Disguised as the Open Lord Laurel Silverhand, Charlaxel Bainray shows up and parlays with the player characters. 
Charlaxle tries to convince the characters to look for the stone for him, or in this case, should I say her? Anyway, Charlaxle will suggest to look for the stone at a Xenathar Guild cellar complex in the Southern Ward. After battling various denizens at the cellar complex, the player characters find a fake stone. It is a clever imitation made by Fenris. The player characters are then supposed to take the fake stone to the Seven Masks Theater in the Dock Ward. There they meet Rong Quan Mystere, who claims to be a member of the Lord's Alliance and works for Laurel Silverhand. In reality, Rong Quan is again Charlaxle in disguise. Upon examining the stone, Ron Quan slash Charlaxle will know it is fake. He informs the characters that Fenris has been arrested and that they should go to the Castle Ward courthouse next to interrogate Fenris. Fenris refuses to divulge the stone's location until he is released and granted immunity for all his past crimes. By one means or another, the characters learn that Fenris has hidden the stone in the old tower in the dock ward. Three stealthy drow will be tailing the characters to the old tower. They will use their levitate ability to quickly get to the top floor, take the stone, and flee across the rooftops in the dock ward. Leading to a rooftop chase between the characters and the drow. The drow then drop down to the street level at the mist shore section of the dock ward. The drow's means of escape is a mechanical dragon turtle named Big Belchy. During the scuffle, the stone is supposed to drop down into the deep waters of the harbor. Thus, the characters will need to find a way of retrieving it. Once they get the stone and a character attunes to it, that character will learn that the vault of the dragons lies beneath a windmill that was converted into a residence at the Sea Ward. At the converted windmill, they meet Colleen, a female half-elf bard. She is an eccentric painter and artist. Before he was ousted, she was one of Lord Dagult's Never Ember's mistresses. And she is now jaded. The cold of winter will not stop Manchun and his Zents from pursuing the stone. They will even be reckless in their pursuit. The Nimblerite delivers the Stone of Galore to Thoracus, a male dragonborn. Thoracus converted an old fire-scorched windmill into a butcher's shop. He has a lucrative side business. The Manchun faction of the Centaurum pay Thoracus to chop up people they kill, and he then sells the meat on the sly. He hid the stone in a recent meat delivery to Cuttle's Meat Pies, located in an alley in the Trades Ward. The gruesome meat was delivered by Gestio Rask a member of the Guild of Butchers. He was paid extra coin to see it delivered quickly and quietly. The alley not only has Cuttle's Meat Pies shop, but also a safe house for the Manchun Zentarum. One of these Zents takes the stone from the meat's delivery and hands it to another Zent named Vavette Blackwater who quickly flees onto the rooftops. But before the adventurers can give chase, they have to contend with 
five bugbears sent by the Xenathar guild to find and rescue Ot Steeltoes, a dwarf who was being held captive by the Zents. The adventurers then chase Vivette Blackwater on the icy and dangerous rooftops. Vivette then drops down and ducks into the Brisson Bright Theater in the Trades Ward. The play currently being performed is called Blood Wedding. This dark drama is awfully similar to the Ravenloft love triangle story between Count Strahd von Zorovich and his younger brother Sergei and Tatiana, the girl they both are in love with. Before the characters arrive and can witness the exchange, Vavette hands off the stone to Agorn Fuko, a male human bard and a member of the Centaurum. His lady companion at the play is Amath Sersant, a female human priestess of Bane. When the adventurers spot Vivette in the darkened theater, she springs from her chair and flees out the nearest door. She then leads her pursuers on a merry chase through the snow-covered streets of the trade's ward. One way or another, the characters learn that Agorn Fuko has the stone and is on his way to Mist Shore in the Dock Ward. However, unbeknownst to the adventurers, Agorn handed the stone to his lady friend, Amath Sersant. Both hired a coach. At the Castle Ward, he dropped off Amath at an old tower called Yellowspire where she lives, before heading off to the Dock Ward. The characters can catch up to Aegorn at Mistshore, at his mother's dilapidated home. When he is captured and questioned, Aegorn reveals that he made one stop on his way and that he dropped off a lady friend who has the stone at her place. At the Old Tower, also known as Yellow Spire, the adventurers confront Amath and her four acolytes of Bane. Right when the adventurers wrest the stone from Amath, Manchun's simulacrum shows up and another battle ensues. By attuning to the stone, a character will learn that the Vault of the Dragons lies beneath the Brandeth family mausoleum in the City of the Dead. By the way, Lord Rainier Neverember's mother's maiden name is Brandeth. As a dungeon master, I would have the encounter chain run in one session. If time is running out, then just narrate the rest of the chain, and have the player characters start at the last encounter of the chain at the beginning of the next session. Although the DM is supposed to have only one main villain, I still would have the other villains also looking for the stone. For instance, if Manchun is the main villain, I still would have Xanathar send a gazer to follow the characters. I would have the Castle Lanterns send invisible imps to follow them. For Jarlaxle, I would have him send two drow to tail the characters. When the characters enter and then are leaving the Vault of the Dragons, I would have all villains sending their forces in, and then all hell breaks loose. This is only a suggestion, and will be very hard to keep track of and implement. Anyway, I am jumping ahead of myself. Regardless of where the Vault is located, its adamantine doors are sealed shut. Due to its protections and special long-ago construction by the dwarves, teleporting into and out of the vault is impossible. Likewise, communication spells, scrying, etc. will be impossible. In order to open the doors to the vault of the dragons, three keys are needed. 
the Dungeon Master can determine each key or just roll for it randomly. The doors cannot be damaged or forced open. The three huge columns in the middle of chamber numbered V2 support crumbling bridges that are 60 feet or 18 meters above. Untouched for ages, within dust-filled secret room V5 is a small fortune. A secret trapdoor in chamber V7 hides a descending spiral staircase that leads down and into the treasure vault. Inside the vault is, of course, the embezzled half a million gold pieces piled in a heap in one of the chamber's alcoves. When the adventurers enter the vault, they will be greeted by an aged dwarf clutching a staff who calls himself Barak Clanghammer. Barak is really the dwarf form of the adult gold dragon named Oranax. He guards the gold for the embezzler and ousted Lord Dagolt Neverember. The staff Barak holds is the dragon staff of Agharon. For even high-level characters, a gold dragon or a dwarf wielding this staff will be extremely difficult to defeat in combat. Thus, the adventurers will need to parley with Oranax and convince him to depart or allow the gold to be removed. The adventurers can claim they came on Never Ember's behalf. This argument is more likely to succeed if Rainier Never Ember, Dagold's son, is with the party. The adventurers can try to convince the noble dragon that Dagolt Neverember embezzled the gold from the people of Waterdeep, and that it would be fair and just to see the coin safely returned to its rightful owners. This argument is more likely to succeed if Vajra Safar, the Blackstaff, and or Laurel Silverhand are with the party. As the player characters leave the vault, with or without the gold, they are confronted by a hostile force sent by the main villain in the adventure. If Xenathar is the main villain, it will send a force of bugbears and a gazer. If the castle lanterns are the villains, they will send a force of cultists. If Charlaxel Bainray is the villain, he arrives along with three drow. If Manchun is the main villain, he sends his simulacrum along with several Santarum thugs. If the gold is given back to the city of Waterdeep, the open lord Laurel Silverhand will visit the player characters a few days later. She will award them with 50,000 gold pieces in total. Even that much coin attracts unwanted attention. Sometime later, several people will beg for loans or donations from them. Some beggars include Floon Blagmore, Volothump Gedrom, Davil Starsong, and others. Thus concludes Waterdeep Dragon Heist. The only thing left to cover is the villain's layers which are outlined in chapters 5 through 8. One of the things that annoys me about the Waterdeep Dragon Heist book is the often missing article words such as the, a, and an. This was probably done to reduce the book down by a few pages. However, doing so makes the adventure book seem like it was written by someone whose English was their second language. Anyway, despite that, I personally love Waterdeep Dragon Heist. So many D&D adventures and modules have the player characters starting in and adventuring around a small town or village. Having an adventure take place in a city is a refreshing change of pace. Thank you for watching.
Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment. I do like feedback. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. It's gonna take have another deep breath think before you say think before you say think before you say i'll play the fool you sit and wait awkward conversation when's it gonna change how has your day been what else can i say what else can i say how else can i say Let's sing a song full of hope, full of pain Why don't you sing along, my friend, for it's our last refrain Forever young, ever strong, ever brave Memories like this never end, no, they don't fade away So when I'm
close to the sun. Close to the sun.